Hi everyone. It is Thursday um, in week three. Um, we're kind of all losing our minds a little bit and we're doing the best we can. So I am going to talk today about stems and leaves or as collectively known as shoots. Um, a lot of this material you might have gotten from some of the um, kitchen dissection videos or when I'm talking about twigs or whatever, but this is sort of the standard um, stuff from chapter 25 vocabulary that's really useful to be able to identify and talk about plants with other plant people. So um, the first thing to know about the above ground parts of vascular plants is that they're super modular. What that means is that it's a small number of parts repeated um, sort of ad nauseum in different directions depending on in which direction the plant needs to collect and concentrate its resources, primarily in this case uh, carbon dioxide and sunlight. Um, so the module that we're talking about here includes these basically four segments. Um, there's an internode. The internode is the length of stem between two nodes. So between nodes means internode. Um, so a stack of internodes on top of each other, that's the stem. The next thing is the node itself. A node is the location along the stem where one or more leaves are attached to the stem and where vascular bundles move from the stem into the leaf blade. So there's the inner node, then there's the node, this location here, and at the node you have the leaf that is subtending, meaning it's occurring under the axillary bud um, which includes the axillary meristem. Now sometimes you don't really see a bud because it's very underdeveloped and sometimes you do and sometimes you might even see an axillary branch but every time you see a leaf along a stem that's an um, that's a node and right above where the leaf is attached you will find a place where a new meristem may start growing. So it's important to realize that this sort of inner node, node, leaf, axillary bud is just repeated and repeated and repeated in the primary growth of the plant. And sometimes it can, in a large tree, for example, this uh, pattern may repeat itself thousands of times during a single growing season to produce every single leaf that you see outside right now. Um, it's also important to remember that every organ, the um, inner node and the, or yeah, the stem and the leaf all contain all three major tissue types, uh, dermal tissue, ground tissue, and uh, vascular tissue. And they're in different arrangements and different kinds of plants. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. Okay, some external morphology vocabulary. A lot of this you probably know or is um, sort of self-explanatory, but I want to draw your attention to some very important and sort of common terms that I just expect everyone to be able to use. Um, so first, if you're talking about a growing uh, stem above ground, a growing shoot, there are multiple ways that leaves might be arranged on the stems. Um, one of the most easy to recognize is opposite, where you actually have two nodes at the same place on the stem. So you actually have, oh my god, um, you actually will have a stem and then two leaves coming out at the same place on opposite sides of the stem. And there are two axillary buds, um, one at each uh, leaf uh, placement at, along the stem. Alternate uh, leaf arrangements are uh, different and they, um, instead of having two leaves coming off at a single place, you only have one and they kind of alternate around the stem. Often if you're looking from above on an alternate uh, uh, leaved, uh, a, a stem where the leaves are alternately arranged, you might actually see that they're in a spiral pattern. That's a very common situation. Um, so that's, uh, that's an easy one to recognize too. If you don't have opposite leaves, you probably have alternate leaves in one way or another. Whirled leaves are much less common. This is where you have a, a whole set of nodes, more than two, at a single location along the stem. So you have an inner node and then a series of leaves all at one place. Um, this is a much less common arrangement, but it's fairly uh, common to see it sort of at a, as a basal whirl. So basal means that the leaves are all uh, generated from the base of the stem, and then there's a reproductive part that shoots out from the center of the basal rosette. 
All right, I'm not going to go into that much detail for all of these other variables. I um, will mention one thing that there are two uh, overall kinds of leaf types. One is simple, where there's a single blade attached to a petiole. Some people call this a leaf stem. It's not a leaf stem. It is called a petiole. The petiole is the part of the leaf which attaches to the stem at the node. Um, so most leaves or many leaves have petioles, although not all. Um, the blade of the leaf tends to be the part that's flat and that contains most of the chlorophyll and the um, chlorenchyma, and most of the ground tissue. That's the uh, part of the stem that's most uh, likely to be photosynthetic. Um, the margin is the margin of the leaf. Sometimes it has different arrangements. Sometimes it's toothed or lobed. Sometimes it's uh, entire, meaning it's smooth. The venation comes in a lot of different forms, and the leaf shape comes in hundreds of different forms. There are many, many different kinds of leaf shapes, and if you get really nerdy into botany, you will learn a whole bunch of different ones, oval, lanceolate, um, and a whole bunch. This is a great website that shows some of the detail. Um, I'll just refer you to it. This is from iNaturalist, and I'll just scroll down really quickly to show how many different kinds of leaf arrangements so this is one that's petiolate. That's the only one we've talked about so far. They can also be all these other different ones. Um, leaf shapes, these are the basic ones, and there's variations on the theme. Um, here's different kinds of leaf margins, all different kinds of veinations. Yeah, so if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I welcome it, and I think you'll enjoy it if you really like um, sort of obscure Latin words. Okay, I'm going to move on, but you can learn to describe a leaf using very specific vocabulary, and that's helpful when you're talking to botanists who may not have seen the leaf you're trying to describe. Um, so all um, so these are the three main kinds of leaves. We have a, where's my cursor? Here it is. Okay, we have the simple leaf, as I mentioned, a single blade. We have two kinds of compound leaves. Compound leaves have leaflets, meaning they have, um, I don't know, like little sub leaves, I guess, that are all attached to a single uh, sort of center vein or a, uh, that would be the mid vein of a simple leaf. Here, it's a, it's sort of a mostly vascular tissue. It's not a stem. Um, the stem is here. You can tell this is a leaf and not a, a bunch of leaves. You can tell this is one leaf because there's only one axillary bud. These leaflets are not associated with axillary buds. So this is a pinnately compound leaf. I have I remember this by thinking of like a pin is long and straight. A pinnately compound leaf has a single axis and then um, leaflets coming off of the um, rachis, the central uh, vascular um, tissue here. Um, those are uh, arranged sort of in a sort of two dimensional way down the um, rachis. <coughs> so many fern leaves are pinnately compound. Um, palmately compound is sort of easy to remember if you think of your hand. So all of the leaflets here, there are five. This is like looks like a buckeye leaf, a Hawaii, Ohio buckeye. Um, it has a petiole, and you can tell that this is the petiole and this is the stem because there is an axillary bud associated where the leaf meets the stem. These are not leaves, they are leaflets because none of them has their own axillary meristem. So these together form a single leaf that is arranged in a palmate fashion, um, like fingers on a hand. So all three of these leaves have petioles. All three of these leaves have axillary buds associated at the nodes. And all three of them have vascular tissue that's moving from the stem into the leaf. And then they all three have the um, major tissues that we've discussed, um, ground tissue, vascular tissue, and dermal tissue. All right, here's a bunch of different uh, simple leaves that you could try to describe. I won't go into them much now. Here are the compound leaves and here are the simple leaves. Um, and they're just a beautiful arrangement out in nature. But remember that actually the structure of above ground parts of plants is really simple. You have an internode, a node where their leaf is coming out, and then an axillary meristem that in a older 
plant or in a plant that loses its leaves might develop into an axillary branch and start growing and becoming a branch, another part of a stem. All right. Oh, one more thing about leaves. So I did put in a couple of um, explanations about fancy words that you can use for describing leaves. Look at this one, sinuate, undulate, cross venulate. All right, so botanists get a little excited about words. I'm gonna leave it there, but go back and look at them if you're into it. All right, so now we're gonna go inside the shoot and we're gonna start at the shoot apical meristem. This is a little bit of review. Um, so it's good to remember that the shoot apical meristem is at the apex or the tip of each growing shoot. And the shoot apical meristem is where all of the new tissues are produced in the growing above ground part of the plant. Um, so the shoot apical meristem is right here. The youngest cells are here, except right at the center here, or right, right at the tip here, that would be the quiescent center. So the quiescent center, again, are very small cells that are mostly nuclei, um, and they divide very rarely. When they divide, oh my god, um, when they divide, they uh, produce cells that eventually will differentiate into ground tissue, as in here, or vascular tissue at the center of the leaves here, or um, dermal tissue at the border of the plant. I'm sorry for my computer, y'all. Um, so it's interesting to remember that the meristem cells can divide in two directions. They might divide sideways to produce new cells um, in an anticlinal fashion. So if here's the mother cell and it divides, it's going to make another cell here. Paraclinal um, uh, divisions allow the plant to increase in length or in um, sort of height of the plant. And anticlinal divisions are necessary when you're sort of making new tissues to uh, create a broader plant. Paraclinal tissue uh, divisions are much more sort of frequent and important in some ways in um, axillary growth of the shoots. We won't go into too much detail on that. Okay, um, just another reminder that there's a, um, a sort of modular format here. You have the apical meristem at the very tip and the leaf primordia. These are not yet true leaves because they are not vascularized uh, fully yet. They don't have fully de um, developed tissue, but they will eventually. So these are the little bitty um, uh, leaf primordia um, or immature leaves. There are bud primordia as well. And then as the um, cells age and become uh, more differentiated, at that point you will start having the leaves um, uh, have truly developed um, vascular tissue and dermal tissue and start having some of the functions of mature leaves. So this is a cross section through an above ground shoot at three different places. So we have a longitudinal section here of a very young part of the stem, a slightly older, almost mature part of the stem, and through the um, fully differentiated mature stem here. So if we start, oh my gosh, start, um, sorry, start at the mature stem, you can sort of see that the external part of the stem has the epidermis, and then there's a cortex, that's parenchyma tissue, that is mostly storage and useful for um, uh, maintaining the structural integrity of the leaf, or I mean of the stem. Um, and then you have pith at the center, that's also parenchyma tissue or gro gro um, ground tissue. Um, these little teardrop looking uh, bundles here are the vascular bundles. And so there are several veins running through the stem. This is a dicot stem. So these dicot vascular bundles have the xylem to the inside and the phloem to the outside. And this white uh, stripe in the middle of the vascular bundle um, is the area that's eventually going to be able to form more vascular tissue um, later in the stem. So that was that was the procambium. All right, um, what else do we want to say here? Oh, I guess I should say that if you cut through the most uh, 
the newest part of the uh, stem, right near the vascular mer or the, right near the apical meristem, you'll find that much less differentiated tissue. You'll see that um, some of these areas are starting to differentiate into epidermal tissue, but there's not very much differentiation at all um, in the youngest part of the stem. Vascular bundles develop eventually, and then they become more differentiated as the plant matures, obviously. All right, one more transverse section. This is a picture photograph instead of a drawing, and you can sort of see what we were seeing before. Um, so the apical meristem is here. It looks almost like a little bat with ears. If the apical meristem is uh, the the um, <coughs> excuse me the um, nuclei here are dyed red and so the apical meristem cells are here these are leaf primordia that are just starting to develop and bud primordia um, which will eventually become the axillary buds you can see more mature axillary buds down here um, and the different meristems so this is the youngest tip of the growing stem this is eventually going to become a petiole of a leaf and the leaf blade would be up here but it's cut off so here you can see the different um, secondary meristems as well as the um, uh, leaves and stems developing. Okay, so vascular stems um, of plants will have different uh, appearances when you put them in cross section depending on the kind of plant that they are. So the vascular cylinder is sometimes um, has gaps between the vascular bundles as pictured here. I think of this as sort of the prototypical dicot stem with a series of uh, vascular bundles. All the vascular bundles have xylem to the inside and phloem to the outside. This one has more of a cylinder. Um, still, the xylem is going to be towards the inside and the um, the, the the phloem to the outside, and then the uh, there's a sort of a sandwich of um, ground tissue, pith in the center and cortex around the outside. The dermal tissue, the epidermis is always at the outside, of course. Um, this uh, arrangement where there's a scattering of veins through the stem is indicative of a monocot stem. So such as you might find in um, uh, a lily plant, for example, where the, their, the vascular bundles are scattered throughout instead of arranged in a neat circle or cylinder. All right, one a little bit more about dicot stems. Um, here we have um, the vascular bundles again pictured um, here in a ring around the, um, the pith. The epidermis is the single cells on the outside. They're very small. They do produce a cuticle very often. Um, the most of the bulk of the stem here is the pith. The cortex is smaller in this particular species. I think this is a um, mint. It looks like it might be coleus. I'm not exactly sure. And here you can sort of see the vascular bundles sort of arranged. They look like this. They look like little acorns. Um, the phloem is here. The xylem vessels are here. And in between the bundles, we call them the interfascicular regions. Um, and the, the cambium, the space between the xylem and the phloem, this is the, was the procambium, and this is the meristematic tissue that can produce both the xylem cells and phloem cells, depending on which way it uh, divides. So you can see all of, you should know most of these words. The only one that you may not know is fascicular. Fascicular just means bundle. Um, so interfascicular is between bundles, and fascicular means within a bundle. And cambium here refers to the meristematic region that produces the vascular tissue, xylem in, um, to the inside and phloem to the outside. Um, yeah, I'll probably leave it there. You can sort of study this vocabulary and ask me questions if you have any. Um, it's also well described in your book. Both of these are figures from uh, the Raven chapter 25. Oh, I wanted to show you monocots because I think they're adorable. So monocot stems um, look a little bit different from dicot stems. Mainly what you see is that there's no sort of a, a neatly arranged pith and cortex. There's just vascular bundles and veins all over the place. And each of the little vascular bundles 
have both xylem and phloem. The xylem cells tend to have much wider bore. They are larger and there's a larger space for moving water around once the cell wall divide, um, sorry, dissolves and becomes a um, vessel element. Um, and so these are your xylem uh, vessels, and then you have sieve tube elements and companion cells, so the phloem cells here. And I always think of uh, monocot stems as having vascular bundles that um, look like little monkey faces. Um, and so if you see a cross section and it looks like it's got a bunch of little monkey faces in it, that is almost certainly a, uh, a, a monocot stem. Um, and they're scattered about in all different ways, indicating that there's uh, veins throughout the um, stem. That's the main thing to remember. Whereas in a dicot uh, plant, the veins are kind of arranged neatly in a circle or a cylinder. All right, so this is a weird picture and I kind of want to explain it a little bit because one question that I want to remind everyone of is that the veins that are in leaves, the vascular bundles and tissues that are in leaves, has to be physically connected to the vascular bundles in the stems. And those have to be uh, physically connected to the vascular bundles in the roots because water has to move in an unbroken stream um, by transpiration from the roots up through the stem, all the way up the stem, into one of the leaves, and then out the stomata. In order for transpiration to work, the connections have to be made. So I want to talk a little bit about how leaves and stems are connected through what we call leaf traces and branch traces. So the leaf trace is a way of thinking about the um, the vascular tissue as it moves from a stem into a the vein of a leaf so the vein in a stem becomes it kind of like is uh, diverted and moves into one of the leaves to support the water budget of that particular leaf branches in the axillary buds are also formed by veins in the stem moving into the axillary bud and adding to the vascular tissue that's developing in an axillary branch as it uh, starts becoming meristematic and then dividing and uh, becoming a branch. So um, leaf traces are the areas of vascular tissue moving from the stem into the leaf. Um, here's a different way of looking that, at, that, at this uh, phenomenon. So you have a stem that's cut through. So here is your vascular bundles in a cylinder. And this is your stem with the epidermis kind of looking greenish on the outside. Here's your uh, axillary bud and your um, leaf blade and your little petiole here. So the, um, the vein in the stem has been diverted and causes a and, and it becomes the mid vein of this simple leaf. Um, so if you did a cross section of the stem right at the node, so if you took a cross section right at the node of the um, stem, what you would find is the um, you would find not a full circle of vascular tissue, but you would find a little bit of vascular tissue called the leaf trace. And you would see that off to the side, sort of near where the um, axillary bud was. And this vein is then going to move into the leaf um, and feed the leaf uh, water and, um, and sugars if necessary, and also ship sugars back from the leaf down the stem for storage in the roots. Um, all right, this is really cool, but I don't think I want to ex try to explain it here because it's going to take me too long. But I don't know. For those among you who are interested in how vascular tissue works, I love this diagram, but it takes too long to explain. So I might come back to it later. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about internal leaf anatomy. So we've talked about stems, and now we're going to switch to talking about leaves, including um, the veins, um, the ground tissue and the vascular tissue. So all of these different structures can be seen in the cross sections of leaves. Um, and we'll talk through them, but I just want to point out that you know almost all of these words already. The only ones you might not know are mesophyll. Um, so mesophyll just means middle of the leaf, right? So the center of the leaf is taken up mostly of ground tissue. Um, that I call chlorenchyma, and your book also calls chlorenchyma. So this is 
ground tissue, parenchyma tissue that has active chloroplasts that are photosynthesizing. Um, palisade and spongy mesophyll um, are two different kinds of uh, ground tissue. They're sort of different uh, styles, I guess. And we'll talk about that when we uh, when I'll show you some pictures. You already know xylem and phloem, so as, um, usually a cross section of a leaf is going to have multiple veins in it maybe um, each vein will have uh, some xylem and some phloem and i like to draw these things i can't draw it here for you um well, i guess i can and hold it up to the well i'll show you a picture okay so here is a cross section of a leaf um, through the mid vein of the leaf so you have to imagine like a leaf blade like this and then we cut it um we cut a leaf like that and then look at it so that the upper epidermis with the cuticle is at the top and if you look really closely you can sort of see um that there are some areas of the cells here that have a coating of wax um the lower epidermis will have stomata um occasionally along them most of the stomata are going to be out here so this is a cut through the vein and then the blade of the leaf is kind of out here and we don't see all of it um the xylem and the phloem show is shown here right so this is your vascular bundle it's protected or it's sort of supported by cholenchyma which is living uh ground tissue that is um has really thick cell walls but only primary cell walls so it um, allows the leaf to be flexible but strong and then here we have the xylem and the phloem now in a if in the cross section of a leaf if you're hold on one moment please um In a cross section of a leaf, if you only have one vein, or in, when you're looking at any veins, um, what you're going to see is that xylem, if you're looking at the top of the epidermis, the xylem is always going to be towards the top and the phloem is always going to be towards the bottom. And I want you to think about why. Um, so remember that in a dicot stem, especially, um, the vascular bundle in a stem always has the xylem to the center and the phloem to the outside. So just think about that as you're thinking about why xylem has to be on the top of the leaves. Um, the mesophyll is here. So this is the palisade mesophyll. So palisade mesophyll is sometimes known as columnar cells. These are column shaped cells that have a lot of um, um, a lot, a lot of chloroplasts in them. So most of the photosynthesis of the uh, plant happens in these palisade mesophyll cells. And then the spongy per, uh, cells here, this is the spongy mesophyll. It has a lot of uh, air tissue and um, sort of irregularly shaped cells. They also have quite a lot of chloroplasts. They are photosynthetic, but they are sort of designated, the tissue is designated by having a lot of air being able to come into them. And that air is where we um, are able to get the carbon dioxide to the palisade mesophyll. So think about why the palisade mesophyll um, has to have these closely packed cells in a vertical fashion um, and the um, spongy mesophyll has um, a lot of air spaces here. So if you think about the physics of how photosynthesis works, I think you'll be able to understand why the uh, plant is arranged that way. So here again are some cross sections of leaves. These two are actually from the same species of plant. And in this case, there are two um, leaves grown in really different conditions. This is a sun leaf and this is a shade leaf of the same species. So you can see some differences here, especially in the mesophyll, but also a little bit in the veins and the cuticle possibly as well. So the sun leaf has a lot of spun, uh, palisade mesophyll and you can see the air um, spaces here. Um, so here what you can see is there's a lot of spongy mesophyll um, here and a lot of palisade, very thickly uh, thick cells or thick leaves with a lot of uh, palisade mesophyll cells that are very highly photosynthetic. Um, here you might see fewer chloroplasts in the cells and a lot more space and also the um, leaf itself is much thinner and if you could see the whole leaf you might see that it's actually broader as well. So some of these differences are reflected as well here in this picture. So sun leaves might have bigger lobes. We saw a, a abstract about that um, last week in your assignment. 
the shaded leaves tend to be less lobed. Um, shade leaves also tend to be thinner and sometimes with a larger surface to volume ratio. Um, so think about that a little bit as you're imagining why sun leaves and shade leaves might have different morphology and anatomy um, depending on what kind of environment they're growing in. Okay, I wanna show you a quick video. Okay, so this is Sir David. Access to light is the great problem here. Those plants that can command the surface can rule the lake, and none does so on a greater scale and more aggressively than this, the giant Amazon water lily. Its gigantic leaves are armored with spines that protect them against any fish that might try to make a meal of them. Giant trichomes. See the netted veination? And the aranchyma that causes the leaves to float. Their huge expanse is kept outstretched and floating on the surface by a lattice of buoyant air-filled struts. Okay. Where do you suppose the stomata are on these leaves? I bet they're not on the bottom. The crinkles in the surface swiftly flatten out as the leaf expands to its full size. The edges are turned up so that the leaf can shoulder aside any competition. Fully grown, a single leaf is six feet across. That's awesome. Virtually no other plants can live in the black shaded water beneath these leaves. They cover the surface so completely and the support of their airfield girders is so effective that birds, most famously the lily trotter, can spend their entire lives walking around on them, collecting insects. Okay, so that is um, almost all that I wanna to talk to you about, except for that I also want you to remind you to look at the videos that I posted about um, stem morphology of winter twigs that are becoming spring twigs. Um, here's just a reminder of some of that. Remember that when a plant lives more than one year, um, most of its primary growth is probably going to drop off. Even in evergreen trees, um, uh, the twigs will have leaf scars because no leaf lives forever, only one or two um, years because they're doing a lot of work and they get a lot of um, sort of abuse from the wind and herbivores, etc. So um, every place where a leaf is uh, positioned along the stem where it falls off, you can usually see a leaf scar. They're shaped differently, but they all have bundle scars associated with them. Those are the places where the vascular bundles left the stem and was diverted into a leaf. Um, and you can see that on this leaf, there were several um, bundles, vascular bundles moving from the stem into the leaf um, and at every point. Um, the terminal bud is where the new leaves should start growing, but sometimes uh, the growth begins at the lateral buds instead. So the um, tree might become branchy at the tips um, and produce new uh, growth from lateral buds of last year's uh, axils of the leaves. So. At this point, you should be pretty well versed in the primary plant body, um, including stems, roots, and leaves. Some of this will be, have been reviewed, but I hope that I have introduced a few new concepts. And what I really, really want you to think about when you're thinking about this material is integrating the roots, the stems, and the leaves, because they're all connected and they have to be connected in order for this whole situation to work. Um, even though the plant is modular, it also has really important networked connections. Um, all of these tissues, stems, leaves, and roots have the three kinds of uh, tissues, ground tissue, dermal tissue, and of course, uh, vascular tissue. Um, and yeah, it's, it's sort of a, it's a, I, it's ironic because it's sort of simple and complicated at the same time. And anyway, I hope you've enjoyed learning about it. Um, next week, we'll talk a little bit about secondary growth or how wood gets formed um, and how trees can live to be thousands of years old. Um, but And then also start getting um, to talk about uh, plant reproduction uh, 
fruits and flowers. All right, that's all I've got for you. I hope you're having a good week and I hope to see you soon.